Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is John Laurent. Uh, I'm the, the R&D director at uh, Pandemic Response Labs in NYC. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the testing and sequencing for SARS-CoV-2 uh, that we've been doing at the lab. Um, and a little bit of the origin story, um, and then a little bit of detail about what our testing platform looks like, what our sequencing platform looks like, and some of the data that's coming off of it. Um, and I also, before we continue, just want to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation to, to speak to you and, and for you all for listening. Uh, so let's jump into it. Um, so really, uh, at its core, um, as I'm sure a lot of you understand, the COVE-2 uh, test principle is pretty straightforward. It's just a PCR. Uh, it is, uh, in particular, a reverse transcription PCR, and it's technically a qPCR. Uh, although there is usually no quantitative measure taken uh, during the test. It's just a qualitative detection or no detection. Um, and so really at its core, what, what we need to do to test for COVID-2 in a specific sample is to take a swab from a person, extract the RNA, and run a PCR on that extracted nucleic acid uh, to, to, to uh, basically test for, for presence of nucleic acid from the viral genome. But the real question that we wanted to answer and to help out with um, at the sort of height of the pandemic uh, this time, roughly this time last year, um, was to really make this high throughput because New York City was really at the peak of, of the pandemic. Um, the city was really hurting. There was a dearth of testing. Uh, and so we, we thought we could meet some of those needs for testing. Um, because of the, some specific infrastructure we had in the uh, lab. And so the question we asked is, how do we make this process more high throughput? Um, and the way that we answered that really is just by automating and parallelizing. And of course, along with that, we had plates with a lot of little tiny wells uh, just to handle all of those samples. And so if we expand those two very simplistic representations of the COVE-2 test set, steps, into a little, uh, a little more granular view of what that involves. Um, we can expand the sample processing part of that into acquisition of samples, accessioning of samples, um, which is really just acknowledgement that you've received that sample and, and put, entered it into your tracking system in the lab, and then reformatting of those samples into a format that is more amenable to processing and automation um, because they do come in a, a large vial uh, usually. Um, and then on the, the sort of testing and PCR side, uh, we take those reformatted samples. Um, we have to isolate the RNA from it or, or the nucleic acid. We have to set up the PCR reaction and then we have to run the PCR reaction. And so on the right side, the, the PCR side of this uh, and, this, and um, the isolation and PCR setup and PCR, we were actually already doing most of this process in the lab uh, at NYU where I was prior to my position at PRL. Um, and we were doing this for a very different purpose than any sort of diagnostic testing, but rather for actually screening very large DNA assemblies that we were building in the lab um, on the megabase scale. And so we had set up a high throughput qPCR platform for doing those screens. Um, and so, like I was saying, we had the infrastructure in place to really help out uh, to, uh, with the testing. Uh, the lack of testing in the city at the time. And so what we really needed to do was adapt this blue bit um, that we already had set up in the lab just so that it was specific to a, a COVID diagnostic test rather than a big DNA assembly screening PCR test. Um, and then the front end, we had to figure all of that out. So how do we receive samples in the tens of thousands? How do we accession them? How do we reformat them? So that was the, the problem we had to solve. Um, and so I'll take you through a little bit of detail on, on how COVID testing works and then what we, how we ended up uh, uh, designing this platform. So uh, just to zoom in a little bit on some details here, um, COVID, as I said, was is just a PCR, really. Um, and so what you need to do uh, to have a PCR is have primers to amplify your target. Um, and then in particular, it is a, a qPCR. So it's a quantitative PCR that uses real-time 
um, detection of that amplification. And it's not, it's a, it in particular uses a probe based detection. And so um, on the top of this diagram, I'm just showing sort of a generic uh, um, coronavirus genome um, and the proteins that are coded on that genome. Um, and all the way over on the right side is what's called the nucleocapsid gene. Um, and this, uh, otherwise known as the N gene. And this is where the primers uh, are that we are detecting in our, um, in our test. And so really what we're detecting is the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid gene. And these primers are actually uh, originally designed by the CDC. So these are the, the uh, very well-known N1, N2 uh, uh, primers and probes. Um, we're not using the N3, as probably a lot of you may know, uh, had some contamination and, and uh, false positive problems. So uh, what you need is two primers to amplify your target and a probe um, that's specific to that amplicon that you're, that you're detecting. And so that probe is actually what's doing your detection. And so you run this through PCR, you get detection. Uh, you get amplification of your target. And that tells you that you have, um, that you have SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid in the sample. So just to get a little more detail on that, how that process actually detects um, um, your target, um, on the left-hand side here, uh, you can see just a, a sort of cartoon diagram of, of, a, of a, what's called the TACMAN PCR, um, where we have a forward primer and a reverse primer that's doing the amplification of your target by PCR, and then a probe that has a fluorophore on it, but also a quencher. And so the quencher doesn't allow that fluorophore to emit any readable signal. Uh, while well, it's intact. As you amplify uh, your target and as that probe has more uh, more target available to bind to because it's complementary to the amplified fragment, um, the, the amplification enzymes actually serve to degrade the probe and so that releases the, the fluorophore from the quencher and so you get increased fluorescence as you increase the amount of, of probe or the amount of amplicon you're creating. And so you get a, over time, over PCR cycles, an increase in readout. And that's diagrammed over on the right side, uh, just showing a bunch of, of, of CoV-2 test samples um, with fluorescence on the y-axis um, and PCR cycle on the x-axis. And so the blue lines are showing positive samples where um, as you cycle the PCR, you get, uh, at some point, you begin exponential uh, amplification of your target and that's bore out by increasing fluorescence signal. And at some point you cross a threshold and we call that the CT threshold. And that crossing that CT threshold uh, essentially tells us that there is target there and we detected it. And so that gives you a positive result. And this can be done quantitatively um, because that CT, the value of that CT uh, actually is indicative of the viral load of the sample. Um, but it is not used in a quantitative way in, in most of most COVID testing applications because there are too many other variables like sample collection, um, et cetera. So it's just a detection or not, but it is somewhat indicative of, of viral load in the sample. And um, so just in particular, I mentioned this before, but just to show you on, on, a, uh, on a light spectrum, what we're detecting, uh, the, we're detecting the CDC N1 and 2 targets, and we also have an RP target, which is a human control. So that's, that's just telling us that we are successfully extracting nucleic acid from the sample. Um, and that's a human gene that we are detecting. And N1 and N2 are our two COVID targets. And so they actually live um, in different, the fluorophores used to detect those actually live in different areas of the, of the light spectrum. And so what we're detecting actually are three targets in a single well. So we're doing what's called a multiplex assay. Um, so we can detect N1 with FAM, N2 with HEX, and RP with CY5. Those are the names of the fluorophores we're using to detect these things. And so what we have is one well per sample in the PCR, but detecting three things. So that's, that's sort of details of, of, of how uh, PCR-based, most PCR-based diagnostics work. And, and so that is how the COVID diagnostic works and the details or the targets that we're detecting in ours. And a lot of other labs, a lot of other uh, developed tests are using those same CDC uh, N1 and N2 primers as well. 
So many of you may already know what they are. So just to, to set a little bit of a timeline here, um, as I said, I, I wanted to give a little bit of the origin story um, for how PRL came to be and how the technology was developed. Um, so I mentioned uh, I was in a lab at, at NYU. Um, we were developing high throughput uh, DNA assembly technology um, that we adapted to, to qPCR-based diagnostics. And so uh, the labs uh, really shut down in early March or in March uh, of last year for research. And so we, we were allowed into the lab because we were de developing uh, COVID testing. And so I think early March, on the 6th of March, we, we sort of sent the first email communications around with a group of us uh, sort of coming up with the idea that we could actually help based on the technology we had already developed. Um, we ordered our first uh, piece of extra automation that we needed, the, an OT2 from Opentrons, um, and that arrived only a short uh, four days later. We had our first PCR results um, a few days after that. Um, and uh, and then throughout the, the spring and summer, there was a whole lot of optimization development. We developed or we, we uh, put together what we called SWAT teams um, that were focused on specific areas. So we had a PCR SWAT team. We had an RNA extraction SWAT team. We had a general automation SWAT team. We even had a uh, SWAT team dedicated to, to making PPE for the community uh, and for hospitals, um, including 3D printed face shields, et cetera. So that was uh, all optimization, development, validation, et cetera, um, over the spring and summer. Um, and then we, we hooked up with, with Opentrons at some point in, during that, during June, uh, we submitted a proposal, proposal to the EDC for, to, uh, to start a testing lab um, for the city. Um, we ended up uh, succeeding with that proposal um, and formed PRL. Uh, and we spent some time looking for a lab space. We did not take possession of lab space until August 28th of last year. Uh, and we were doing live testing two weeks, a little over two weeks later on September 14th, uh, which is pretty wild. And that was a rough two weeks of lab setup, uh, equipment, validation work, et cetera. Um, so we, we submitted our EUA and our LDT on the 10th uh, to the state, um, and we've been testing ever since. Uh, we've also submitted uh, a, an EUA and LDT for pooling, pooled sampling, or pooled testing, um, and for a combined COVID and flu test as well. And on the bottom, I'm just, I just wanted to show uh, some of the early photos from that very early work in the lab. So on the far left on the bottom is, is the drawing of our very first PCR uh, experiments, the design of those. Um, and then on next to that is the is a diagram, which you'll see a little more fleshed out version in a few slides of our first sort of sample tracking overview and, and all of the software involved, what the software would have to keep track of to keep track of all of the samples and then in the middle is some reformatting, early reformatting iterations on the OT2, um, and then our first two uh, Felixes for RNA extraction, and then finally in September, we are uh, making the news in the, the lab. So one other, uh, just to get into some of the details of, of the pipeline, um, one of the other things that uh, I wanted to mention is that we also inactivate all of our samples because if you can imagine we're processing 30,000 samples a day, we're taking, we're processing about 90,000 milliliters of, of sample every day. And uh, thinking about that much uh, live virus, uh, potentially live COVID tests was a little unnerving. So we did some experiments early on looking at inactivation um, of the sample just to make sure we could inactivate and still detect virus. And so an hour, we our inactivation is an hour at 65C, and we t uh, some data showing on the right, um, but we also have a lot more than than what I'm showing here suggests that we lose about one CT of detection with that inactivation process, um, which we uh, accepted for the sake of safety uh, for lab personnel, etc. So all sort of distilled down a little bit of, of a few months of, of work. Um, 
in also in the RNA extraction stuff, uh, we custom designed um, our extraction uh, protocol. We run 94 samples on a run, so there's two control wells. Um, it has about a 35 minute runtime on on the Felix, uh, which is a 96 well liquid handler. We are using an off the shelf uh, reagent set uh, called Megmax, which a lot of people are using. Um, though we have been developing a, uh, a homebrew uh, reagent mix, which we haven't started using yet, but it, it has uh, a very promising results that actually look uh, to be more efficient and, and much cheaper um, for us. Uh, so we are working on things like that. Uh, and our limit of detection is about 200 to 300 virus per milliliter uh, of original specimen. So just to lay it all out there uh, in uh, some detail, this is the whole, whole pipeline as it exists. So um, we acquire samples, we accession them, and while we're accessioning them, we, we place them in um, custom sample racks that we had designed and manufactured for our reformatting equipment, which is currently an Opentron's OT2 robot, which maybe uh, some of you are familiar with. Um, and then uh, that is a single channel uh, transfer of an aliquot from every specimen um, into a 96 well plate um, so that we it's more amenable to automation. And then it goes from there, everything's done at 96 or 384 wells at a time. And so the Felix uh, does our extraction, as I mentioned. Um, we had a lot of in-house experience in the lab at NYU because we're already using it for similar purpose. Um, and then we put it on then our RNA samples go on what's called what we call the work cell, which is the light cycler for the qPCR plus some other ancillary equipment to help set up that PCR. Um, we already also had this work cell, as I mentioned, for for our qPCR high throughput qPCR platform at NYU. So it's it's designed uh, very much after that one, uh, the one we are using in PRL. In terms of throughput on on each of these steps. Um, the accessioning, as an estimate, we get 32 samples per rack. Um, an estimate is that it takes about 10 minutes to accession one rack of tubes. So a, a well-trained, experienced accessioner can do about 180 samples in an hour. Um, the sample reformatting on the o on each OT2 takes about an hour for per plate of 94 samples. Um, and then the extraction takes about 40 minutes or so with some setup time. Uh, per 94 samples. Um, and then the light cycler run, we are doing 376 wells at a time. Um, and so 376 samples per run, that takes about an hour. Um, we have two light cyclers on each work cell. So each work cell uh, can do about 750 samples per hour. And if you look at those throughputs of each individual step, there is some difference in throughput. And so this isn't really a one-to-one -one process, but rather a many to one process. So this is the sort of real stoichiometry of of the testing lab uh, as it exists right now. And this is laying out the equipment that's present on what we call one line, um, which is just one set of parallelized equipment um, that it's, it is one unit, essentially, um, that leads to one work cell. And so one work cell, as I said, has two light cyclers on it. We need eight Felixes to feed those two light cyclers and we need about 12 um, OT2s to feed those Felixes for extraction. And so these are the stoichiometries that we actually have in the lab. Um, we currently have uh, three lines operating. And so we have 30, uh, roughly 36 OT2s. I think we have a few extra. We have 24 Felixes, six light cyclers. And so we can do about uh, 2,200 samples per hour um, or uh, 45,000 samples per day, uh, assuming around a 21 hour uptime. And we are operating 24 seven. So that 21 hour uptime is pretty accurate and allows for uh, some downtime. So putting a little more uh, detail on here, because it's not uh, enough to just take in samples and process them all through a bunch of robots, you actually do have to get the result for every test and send it out to the right person, uh, of course. So what we did, um, along with all the testing, all of the scientific side and 
and the extraction and, and reformatting and PCR, et cetera, is we built an entire uh, in-house made software layer that tracks the sample through all of these handoffs, through all of the, the processes and the robotics, uh, and then also analyzes the results of the PCR and sends a result to the, uh, the client software so that a doctor or a patient can receive that result properly. Um, and so we call that system David. Uh, it stands for Diagnosing Viral Disease. Uh, it's also a nod to David Baltimore, who many of you may know is a very well-known virologist. Um, and so David in this diagram as it exists right now is depicted in this blue uh, horizontal line in the middle of the slide. Um, and it uh, talks to uh, middleware software um, that actually is what currently talks to the client software. And so the client software here would be something like Epic or Cerner, uh, et cetera. Um, and David and the middleware talk to each other at two stages. One is the reformatting scan. So we have a scan before we reformat all of the tubes into the, into the plate, and we have a result upload at the very end of the test process. Um, all in between those two steps, uh, everything is, is scanned, but everything is sort of processed internally to David in the lab. And so at accessioning, we're really talking to the middleware software. And then David has to talk to that software to uh, then verify that it, the accessioning scan is uh, the tubes in the racks from the accessioning scan are also in the, in the same position for reformatting. And then all of that after that is really an, an automated scanning. Um, and it's scanned a plate at a time. And so we have to uh, make sure that the reason we have two scans up front is to make sure that as we're scanning a plate, we know that every sample in that plate is in the right slot uh, because we can no longer scan each individual sample at that point. We have to rely on the single plate barcode to represent the 94 samples. And then finally, the 384 samples and the life cycle plate. So this is a little complicated. So a huge effort being put in right now is to really simplify this um, and make David a little smarter. So this is this is what we're working on now is to is to sort of get rid of that middleware layer um, and have David be talking directly to the client and directly to all of the automation equipment and all of the users in the lab and have that really be a two-way communication as well. Um, because in the current iteration, David really just gets presented data from instruments um, but has no interaction with those instruments. Other than that, we are working to integrate David directly with instrumentation to run it, et cetera. Um, and also monitor those instruments for faults, et cetera. So this is the, the sort of dream that's happening right now. Um, just to show you guys a taste, because David is also what we use in lab to do the analysis and releasing of results. Um, so just to give you guys a small taste of what that looks like, this is a, a screenshot of an actual PCR test plate that came through the lab um, recently. Um, and so it's showing the 384 plate format of of uh, the PCR plate, um, we're seeing on the upper left of that of that uh, diagram uh, the N1, N2, and RP tabs. So you can see the signal in all of the wells or all of the channels, um, and then you can you can also list through those results. And this just gives you a plate plate centric overview of the uh, results. You can see in the bottom left are our three controls actually. Uh, so we have three positive RNA controls at different concentrations, and then a single empty uh, negative control uh, in the upper left of that, that four well quadrant. So this plate looks good. Um, and then you can also visualize, so actually the diagram I showed earlier, this is exactly the same figure. This is actually taken directly from our, our in-house uh, analysis software. And this just allows you to sort of make sure all of these curves have nice nice shapes to them. Um, there's nothing goofy going on in the PCR uh, that you need to be concerned about. And then, um, uh, so all of these plates, every single plate we run uh, through the lab is actually reviewed in this way by uh, a technician um, and then released manually to the software uh, and to the hospital system. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of, of statistics on, on our testing. 
uh, numbers. Um, I've mentioned already we are doing about we have the capacity to do about 45,000 tests per day. Um, since September 1st or September 14th, when we turned all the machines on, um, we've done about two, just over two and a half million total tests. Um, and so on, on the right side is just a, a cumulative uh, graph uh, of all of our testing. And you can sort of see we started pretty slow at the beginning as we were bringing on um, clients and, and have been ramping since then. Um, and uh, we've also since September 14th have been running 24 seven. We started 24 seven and we've continued 24 seven with three shifts um, with, with over a hundred staff on hand um, as well. Um, our turnaround time is quite good. So our goal from the beginning has been to have turnaround time under 24 hours. Um, we've so far met that goal quite easily. Um, so half of our samples actually we turn around in 10 hours or less, 95% uh, of them in 18 hours or less, and, and uh, almost 100% are, are less than 24 hours. So some of the, the current work that we're working on, we're sort of working on optimizing right now um, because our work is never really done, uh, of course. Um, we're we're working on sample collection. Um, so right now we are taking a huge variety of sample types or sample tubes um, just due to the number of clients we're taking on and they're uh, uh, this, just simply that there aren't enough sample collection devices to go around. And so people are just uh, getting whatever they can buy essentially. And we are able due to sort of our flexibility and that, our custom racks and all of that, and which we can very quickly design new ones and have them very quickly manufactured, um, are able to accept a variety of different different sample collection devices. Um, but that said, standardizing that sample collection um, would make our lives easier, everyone's lives easier, I think. And there are ways to do this, I think, in, in much safer and more automation-friendly uh, formats, which I'll mention a little bit briefly about in a in a couple of slides. Um, we're also working on alternative instrumentation. Um, so one thing we'd like to really do is, is automate accessioning them as much as possible. Um, it's currently a 100% manual process. Um, so we'd really like to, to automate that a little more so that we can increase uh, the throughput and reliability of that process. Um, reformatting. Uh, we would also, we're working on different instrumentation to increase throughput and decrease our hands-on time. It's currently a fairly hands-on process, even though the, the liquid handling is all automated. Um, extraction, we're also working on alternative instrumentation to, to increase throughput again and also decrease hands-on by, by having uh, a, a robot load the, load the, ro uh, the deck with reagents, et cetera. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, we're also working on the sample tracking uh, pipeline to really optimize that and, and turn it into a much more fleshed out uh, system, um, including things like live tracking so that we can query where any given sample is or we'll just be live aware. So this would be akin to what many of you may know uh, is the Domino's Pizza Tracker, which you used to, I don't know if you still can, uh, maybe, but you used to be able to track where your, what stage your pizza was at uh, online. Um, and then, of course, the instrument integration. And so this turns it into, turns David uh, into a two-way street, basically, talking to instruments and, and being talked to by instruments. So just to give you an example of, of, of the first thing, the sample collection that we're working on and uh, sort of seeing slowly increased adoption, um, if I, if I re-show you the sort of overall pipeline of the acquisition, accessioning, reformatting, isolation, and, and PCR, that pipeline really takes, you know, it's about an hour at each step. But um, just to include some processing time, the sort of theoretical minimum here is about six to seven hours. Um, and so we could decrease this if we got rid of some of these steps uh, and sort of obviated their, them. Um, and so one of the things we've been working on is this sample collection in a, in a more automation-friendly format. So these are sometimes 
referred to as matrix tubes, um, which is a specific brand name of these types of tubes, but really they're just uh, 96 well format tubes that have a, a 2D barcode integrated to, onto the tube. Um, and so you can put media in these tubes and you can collect sample directly into them. And then you really don't have to do any of the reformatting steps. Um, depending on the media you've put in, um, say DNA RNA shield, which is a product from Zymo, um, which sort of instantly inactivates uh, the virus, but also preserves the RNA and DNA that's in that sample, then you also don't have to do any inactivation uh, of that sample and it's completely safe for the person collecting the sample, for the people transporting the sample, and for the people in the lab processing the sample. Um, it also eliminates any need for cold chain. It's, they're stable for at least 30 days at, at room temperature um, uh, with no loss of, of detection ability. And then you can also, because of the 2D integrated barcodes, you can accession these things 96 samples at a time or a full plate. You can decap them 96 at a time and recap them 96 at a time, and you can put them directly onto the extraction robot. And so doing this shaves our processing time to about two to three hours. Um, so we are seeing, we are currently collecting with these um, and seeing increased increased adoption. And it's really driving our turnaround times down um, to a, well below 10 hours for a lot of samples. Um, so some other things that we're currently working on um, are, are pooled testing uh, for schools. Um, and here I'm talking, some of you uh, probably know of pooled testing as uh, lab-based pools. So individual samples would come in and then the lab, just to deal with the volume, uh, would pool multiple samples together and, and test that pool and then you would reflex uh, to, to sort of distinguish which sample in a positive pool was positive. Here, um, we are capable of doing that, although we have not turned that capability on live yet, um, as we haven't really had the need to uh, 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 capacity-wise. Um, so here, though, we what we're ramping up to start very soon in the next couple weeks is uh, what I call site pool testing. Um, basically, you have a, a number of people at a specific site. Um, uh, a good example of this is a classroom. You'd have a classroom of 20, 20 kids or so. Um, each of them does a, a, an anterior nasal swab, puts all of those swabs go into the same tube. And so you have one tube that represents every kid in the classroom. It's all essentially anonymous apart from the identification of the classroom. Um, those samples get sent to the lab and we test them as a pool and we can only report back um, the, uh, I should advance this, uh, my apologies. So I'm just showing on the top the, the normal test pipeline. We see an individual diagnosis uh, for an individual sample for an individual person. On the bottom, what I was just explaining is this site pool testing um, where we have many people putting their swabs into a single tube, we get them in the lab, we hydrate those tubes, those swabs because they're delivered to us dry. And then we extract and, and we can say that a pool was positive, um, not that any individual person was positive. Um, and this is just a, a surveillance measure that works well for cases of low positivity. And then in a positive pool, we could reflex back for individual testing uh, to determine who, who uh, the positive uh, member of that pool is when we're starting this in, in the NYC and DC areas this month. Another thing we're working on uh, is um, at-home saliva collection. So in this case, we would have, we are working with a telehealth uh, partner to um, serve as the uh, prescriber of, a, of an at-home collection device, a COVID test that uses saliva. And so a person would order the test, they would, uh, submit the saliva sample um, by mail to us. Um, we would do that test individually in the lab and report it back to uh, say an app um, that our telehealth provider um, has built. And so this, the, we're ramping this up in the next um, month or two, it looks like. So what else? Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but we are opening uh, some new labs soon. So we're opening DC, I think next week. 
uh, LA and Seattle, we are also opening new labs very soon. And then we have six additional labs beyond that, um, originally planned for, for 20, uh, by 2022. And so this is a huge amount of infrastructure uh, for testing for something that will hopefully be disappearing or, or at least waning very soon in, in COVID. Um, and so, but what we think we've built is a really uh, differentiated platform for low cost, high throughput PCR based testing. Um, and that flexibility and low cost and high throughput means that we can, it can really be adapted to any, nearly any uh, PCR based diagnostic. And so that's exactly what we are trying to do. So, and, it, and that would require really minimal sample handling changes to the front end. Um, and so our next products that we're, we're working on currently in the lab um, are a respiratory panel. We're actually submitting this within the next week or two um, for approval uh, as an LDT. Um, this has 18 targets included on it. Um, we're also working on an STD panel, a GI panel, and, and the blood panel um, to be uh, submitted uh, planned for this year. So that's where TRL uh, testing diagnostics is right now. So I'm going to quickly um, go through uh, the next sort of topic um, uh, since we covered the, the testing and that's sequencing. So I showed this exact same diagram at the beginning of the testing um, slides, but I wanted to show it again for the sequencing slides just to differentiate what um, sequencing is really doing for us. So. As I showed, this is a diagram of, of a generic coronavirus genome, and we're only testing for the presence of the N gene or the nucleocapsid gene by PCR. And that's sort of on the lower half of this, exactly the sequences that these primers are binding to. They're very near each other. Um, and so this is really looking for a very small part of this genome, um, which is actually rather large for a virus. And so sequencing, what sequencing tells us is, is not just that this N gene is present or that these little amplicons are present, but th rather that one, the whole thing is present, but also exactly what the sequence of that, of that virus is in a specific sample. Because as we know, viruses mutate very quickly. Um, and as I'm sure everybody is aware of, there are a lot of concerns about new variants popping up um, that can sort of uh, evade the vaccine the vaccines that are out or evade uh, prior infection protection. So sequencing is a very important uh, part of surveillance. Um, and so we've been ramping up sequencing very recently um, in the lab to, to do that surveillance. Um, and so one of the very important aspects of our sequencing pipeline is that it's integrated directly into the testing line. And so um, what I mean by that is that the RNA that we isolate for the PCR test actually is diverted directly, well, it's also carried through the PCR, it's saved and diverted directly to the sequencing pipeline for any positive specimens that we'd like to sequence. Um, and just to put a little more detail on that, um, the, the NYC test lab, um, which is on the east side of, of Manhattan, um, near NYU Langone, um, is doing the testing and the isolation, and then we transfer it to our uh, sequencing facility in Long Island City, uh, where I'm at now. Um, and, and then it goes through uh, a complicated sample processing pipeline where we hit pick uh, positive RNAs that pass our criteria um, for sequencing. We do uh, a library prep on those samples, um, and then we are able to sequence them um, and with some success rate. Um, our current sequencing capability in terms of equipment is uh, on the right side here. So we have a MySeq, we have a NextSeq 550, and a NextSeq 2000, uh, which are essentially running all day, every day. Uh, and just to show a similar timeline for the development of the sequencing, although it's quite small because it happened very, very quickly, our first pilot test of that pipeline uh, were done in uh, December. and um, by February 1st, we had agreed to start sequencing for the city at a rate of about 500 genomes per week, um, but ramping to 2,000 per week uh, through February and March. Um, and so we've been uh, nearly, we haven't, uh, we didn't quite hit 2,000 a week until actually sometime in April, uh, but that's what we were ramping towards. 
Um, and while we were doing that, of course, we were simultaneously sort of developing all of the process involved in transport, transporting RNA and maintaining integrity of those samples during that transport and, and handling in, in the sequencing lab, which we, by the way, did not move into the sequencing lab until uh, early January. <laughs> so it's been a wild ride. Um, and we're currently continuing to ramp that sequencing capacity to uh, a goal of about 10,000 genomes per week. And just to show some, some data here, uh, this is a, a plot of sequences in GISAID that uh, are coming from various facilities. I've cut a lot of them out just to show a few key ones. Um, that top pink line is Wadsworth, the, the state DOH lab, um, which has been doing a lot of sequencing. Um, and the below that in blue, uh, you'll see PRL NYC, which basically came on the scene um, if you look way down at the bottom of that inflection there uh, in, in February, and it's been uh, ramping very quickly uh, since then. Um, notably, this does not include 2,000 sequences we just submitted earlier this week, and so probably by next week it'll look something like this, uh, hopefully. Um, so uh, we are continuing to ramp and, and this is really going to be a linear uh, or more uh, curve continuing. So uh, just to break that uh, or sort of zoom out a little bit just to show the New York as a whole as it relates to other states, um, I can see Texas and California really got off to early sequencing uh, starts. Um, and down in January, New York really started ramping in that if you look back at the prior slide, you can see that that's really driven by Started, started with Wadsworth and, and then uh, is, is being now driven by a combination of us and Wadsworth. Um, and to show this in broken down by, by variants, um, this is not detected only by PRL, um, but these are the ramp rates of the appearance of various variants uh, in the New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut uh, area. So this data um, really is from PRL. So this was actually featured in the New York Times recently, uh, I think early this week. Um, so this is just showing the appearance uh, or the, the ratios of different variants in our sequencing results across the last several weeks. So as you can the, really appreciate here, the major trend is that variants have been of concern in color uh, are definitely increasing over time and now comprise uh, uh, roughly 80% of the sequences we are seeing. And in particular, we're seeing this uh, two dominant variants. One is the, the B117, commonly referred to as the, the UK variant, and then B1526, which actually is, is a New York uh, origin variant. Um, and one uh, other way to show this data is actually overlaid on the the map of the city. Um, and so here, each plot is just um, uh, a week in the last, or a couple weeks in the last uh, two months. Um, and so on the left is, is the month of February, where um, most of the virus, uh, of the genome sequences we see are actually what we call other forms or not variants of concern, essentially. Um, and as you move to the right, which is uh, most uh, ends on April 1st, the very dominant signal you're seeing is this pink B1526. Um, and that 5126, um, I guess I'll show in a couple slides, uh, can be broken down a little bit further. Um, so this is just showing uh, some internally generated plots of the same data up until April 4th um, of the B117 distribution across the city. Um, and then this 526, uh, which can be broken out, as I said, into variants, versions without or with this E484K mutation that is, um, some people worry is, is a potential mutation that can confer the ability to break through vaccines or, or uh, prior infection protection. And so this is showing the distribution of samples that have that 484K, 526 variants that have that 484K. Um, uh, which are distributed across the city. There's a large spike in Roosevelt Island, which is a little concerning. 
Um, and then this is the 526 um, without the 484K uh, mutation, which is distributed quite differently than, than with. Um, and then the last thing I'll show you, um, just to wrap it up, to combine, uh, I guess, these two themes of testing and sequencing is just to show you a plot of um, the test on the left side is our, our distribution of, of tests, and this is the originating um, sample zip code. And so um, this is a heat map just showing which counties um, or which zip codes, uh, excuse me, our, our tests are coming from. Um, and then on the right is showing which zip codes are our sequences are coming from, um, and the major the major uh, thing I want to point out here is that we do believe we are getting a very representative uh, sample of sequences from our test samples, which are really done randomly with the only criteria being CT value. We typically sequence things with CT values less than 30, although we randomly will spike in uh, or throw in some higher ones just to see what we can do, and we do some sometimes uh, successfully sequence those. Um, and that criteria is really just to increase the probability of success because high CT samples are very difficult to sequence. Um, so really just wanted to show that, that we are getting a very good broad distribution of, of the city in our sequencing and not biasing it towards any, any one area um, outside of where our sequencing is, or our testing is biased. So I'll wrap up by thanking uh, the people who make it happen. So this is the executive team, John Badal, the CEO, um, Chris Mall, formerly of Salesforce, Greg Greeley, our COO of, of Amazon, and Shirag is our medical director, CJ, who is really running the strategy and ops team. Um, and then our scientific advisory board, uh, Jeff Buka at NYU is the, the chair of that. Um, and then we, we have uh, six other members that, that are helping uh, guide us. Uh, and then the real people that actually do the work uh, day to day. Um, so I split this out into the PCR test development team, which is led by Nili Ostrov, um, formerly of Harvard, um, and then a, a team of very, very bright uh, scientists and technicians um, and managers. Um, and then the sequencing development team uh, is led by Henry Lee. Um, and uh, Michael Hammerling and Hai Ping, who are the, the lead scientists, and then uh, another team of, of very uh, awesome technicians uh, and scientists, and then our project management team, uh, who really help keep us all in control. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for listening, and I'll, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you guys have uh, uh, written. <laughs>